So one of the true heroes of the USS Monitor was indeed Samuel Dana Green. And we can easily say that because at certain times, he takes a critical leadership role and actually helps the Monitor survive at different times. Uh, he is uh, <clears throat> going to be the man that really helps save the Monitor as it's coming south. Uh, we'll go more into that as we talk about him. And he actually uh, will do uh, very similar when the Monitor did sink and during the battle. Uh, he uh, was extremely heroic in his efforts to fight this Confederate ironclad, the CSS Virginia, also known as the Merrimack. Well, Green is not just someone out of nowhere. His father is George Sears Green, who is a graduate of West Point, class of 1823, second in his class, that made him an engineer. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, West Point was the engineering school of America at the time. So Sears will become a civilian engineer and work on several major road building and railroad bridge building projects uh, throughout the nation. In fact, that's why his son is going to be born in Cumberland, Maryland uh, on February 11th, 1840 because that's where the senior Green was working. So um, Samuel Dana Green is going to attend um, the, uh, uh, well, I, I want to, here is his father, um, just to talk a little bit about him. He is the founder of the American Society of Civil Engineers and Architects. Um, he uh, will actually join the army at first, they kind of didn't want him. They thought he was old and injured. Nevertheless, um, he will be the real hero of Culp's Hill. So when you're at the Battle of Gettysburg, you can actually see his more than life-size statue for what he did to save uh, the Union's right flank uh, during that battle. But until that, until... July 2nd, 1863, he's not that well known except in engineering circles. And actually his son becomes a shining light even before the father does. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, his actions were outstanding. Now, um, I have to tell you that um, Sammy Dana Green will of course attend the United States Naval Academy. Um, he will graduate seventh in his class of 1859. Now remember the academy is fairly new. Uh, however, he goes through a three year a period of instruction, including a sea voyage. This is showing where Fort Stevens was, which was originally the uh, uh, coastal defense fort that became the United States Naval Academy. Um, his first assignment uh, was going to be on the new steam screw sloop of war, the Hartford. And he will cruise with the Pacific Squadron and uh, actually escorting ambassadors, a very ambassador uh, ward who played a major role after the second opium war in kind of ensuring American interests are protected. <coughs> Excuse me. He will um, actually, you know, be, he was a cadet midshipman, then he became named a midshipman, then he was promoted uh, to lieutenant um, in 1861. Now, when um, all the buzz about the Monitor began to reach the news, young, now Green had just returned back uh, to the United States on the Hartford because of the war service. And as a result of that, Green will actually send letter, a letter to John Worden shortly after Worden had been detailed as commander of the Monitor. 
saying, uh, you know, dear sir, uh, uh, um, I'm not quoting the letter exactly, uh, but he, he says, I understand that you are now in command of the ironclad battery, the Ericsson, because at first it was called the Ericsson's battery. And as a result of that, uh, he will uh, say, I would like to serve on this experimental vessel. So Worden, not really knowing who Green was, but recognizing Green's record, uh, he had advanced very quickly to the rank of lieutenant, and he will send a letter to Gideon Wells saying, because at this time, um, Worden had the job of assembling all the officers and crew. He had to actually do a survey saying who was needed, where were they needed? And the first thing he really wanted was an XO. Green didn't ask to be XO. He just asked to serve on the monitor. Nevertheless, um, uh, Warden will send a letter to Gideon Wells, and Wells will say, this is your decision, but Green is an outstanding young officer. So he agreed with word, and, and as a result of that, a green becomes one of the earlier um, people assigned to the monitor. Of course, Worden was number two, green's number three. Number one was Albin Steimers, who was a chief engineer for the U.S. Navy, and he was there to pay attention to what Erickson was up to because the U.S. Navy really didn't trust Erickson, but so much. Um, I think that's a topic for another lecture, but nevertheless, um, they didn't. So, now, I have to say that Green is part of the entire process. He goes with Warden when they look at the volunteers assembled on the U.S. receiving ship North Carolina uh, to pick out who, which volunteers that could indeed serve on the monitor. He is part of the selection of the um, petty officers and actually the engineering officers because of his service on the um, Hartford at sea with engines. He has somehow, you have to realize back then, there was a dividing line. If you were an engineering officer, you were looked down upon by those who were called the officers of the line. In other words, you guys are greasy. We're not. We're up on deck. We'd rather be in sailing. Uh, so that, there was uh, a constant questioning of those engineers. Nevertheless, um, uh, Green. so Green helps put the ship together in many ways. His job is, as executive officer is to ensure through intermediaries like Lewis Stoddard that supplies are brought on. He also uses William Keeler. William Keeler actually meets uh, um, Green and he will say that uh, Green um, is a, I got the quote exactly, that um, Green is a young man also in the regular service, black hair and eyes, eyes that look through a person and, will, and we know that it will carry out his orders and I have no doubt he will do so with strength. So Green, now if you look at photographs, and we'll see some photographs of Green, we'll realize he had a somewhat dark look about him. Um, but uh, being assigned to this new ship is really to ask being on this ship. Now, Worden wasn't asked to be on the ship. He was told, you know, we think you're the guy who should take command. Worden then said, yes, you know, you don't say no back in those days. But this is a ship that requires total adjustment to because it's a ship that like, no one had ever seen before or served upon before. And so that required um, a great deal of extra training. Because there was only a crew and officers of 57 men, everyone had to be cross-trained. Cross-trained to the extent that when it's time to reload the turret, 
who is going to be pulled from the firemen and the coal heavers to come and do that work because it's a very uh, specific work. Green's real job on that ship was not just as XO, but was actually as the chief gunnery officer. Now, he had gunners that served under him, but he was in command of that turret during action. And this is a little peculiar, but it's because of where the location of the pilot house, which you can see on this, um, uh, this, this drawing, where it's located and where green is. So I just want you to think uh, uh, of that distance, monitors 171 feet in length, right? And so I want you to think we've got about uh, 60 feet to 70 feet that divides the command central with the turret. And so that becomes a very critical thing. Um, so, anyway, the monitor goes through its trials. It has several trouble with its uh, steering mechanism. And nevertheless, um, it is able to leave New York on the afternoon of March 6, 1862. Now, they leave in pretty good weather. Now, no one really cares about it leaving. Um, actually, John Driscoll will comment to Green, why aren't there aren't there the sailors up on the yard arms all waving and cheering us on? And Green retort was, they never seen any vessel like this float. Well, he's true. In fact, he'll be very concerned with it keeping afloat, I have to tell you. Now, this is, of course, a picture from the sinking. But I have to tell you, after leaving uh, New York, um, the ship is going to um, all of a sudden, the first day at sea is pretty good. They get down the New Jersey coast, and then all of a sudden they hit a storm. It's a very storm that had delayed the CSS Virginia from going into Hampton Roads on March 6th. Of course, this is going to be early March 7th, and the storm comes, and and Green will later write, I found much motion to the vessel, and I could see green water through my deck light. And uh, so Green will write uh, to his parents that the angry 10-foot waves would strike the pilot house and go over the turret in beautiful curves and came through the narrow eye holes in the pilot house with such force as to knock the helmsman completely around from the wheel. Now, to guide the vessel from there, you actually were up on the on the turret itself. You know, there's grates that go on, and so you'd be looking out. Now, 10-foot waves, when you think the monitor is about 9.5 feet above the water's edge, what does that tell you about this experience? Um, and it was uh, really terrible. And in fact, um, as uh, Green will later write, see, what happens is that waves get so terrible and the storm is increasing. Worden becomes seasick. And so, you know, he's unable to do anything. So the leadership of the monitor falls on the shoulders of, uh, of Samuel uh, Green. And so Green will actually take command because the mechanical systems are starting to fail. And so Green actually, uh, and the reason being is because the water is rising. Uh, Green will write uh, his parents, the water continued to pour down the smokestacks and blower pipes in such quantities there was immediate danger that the ship would flounder. And so when that started to happen, of course, on a ship like this, um, you know, you're all steam powered, right? All the water coming in, rising in the engine room, what's going to happen? The engines go out. What happens then? This obnoxious fumes uh, will fill the vessel. So Green does a couple of actions. 
Number one, he sets many of the uh, crew assigned to the gunnery section will will actually be handing hand pumps and they start a bucket line. That's to calm the sailors. Now the pumps have stopped working. So the most critical thing, uh, Green actually goes into the engine room, assesses uh, with the assistance of Isaac Newton, um, not the Isaac Newton, uh, just to let you know, uh, this is <coughs> it's a different one, but he's on the monitor. <coughs> and so he will actually realize that the problem is that the pumps will get the water out of there, but they got to get the steam engines working again. So Green organizes crew, because just think, they put a bandana over their faces to, and they wear these curses, right? And so they use those to be able to go into the engine room for a minute to begin able to make repairs because the, the ship operated, it's one thing to get the steam going again, but the greatest thing is to get the obnoxious fumes out of the ship. You have to be able to get the belts working. And the biggest trouble is the belts are made of what? Leather. And leather does what? <laughs> it expands when wet. So you have this huge trouble of trying to get those back onto a belt. John Driscoll talks about having to go in in the pairs and comments how Green would rotate people to go back up to the turret on, you know, just remember, we're in a terrible storm, right? And the engine's failing, the pumps aren't working, you got to get the engine going to get the pumps are working, and you got to go into carbon monoxide. Now, um, that's not good. So what happens when they rotated people out of the turret, they immediately took some of them they carried up, like John Driscoll will actually write that he's carried back up to the top of the turret to be refreshed by the wind. You're also being drenched by water. So this is a horrible scene. Um, and uh, so Green, um, will set about saving the ships. Uh, actually, he'll say, things for a time look pretty blue, although we might have to give up the ship. They actually, Green orders the flag to be flown upside down and uh, indicating distress. He hails and gets the Seth, Seth Low, which is the ship towing the monitor south um, to move the ship towards uh, the shore, and they come close to the shore in an area known as Fenwick Island, Delaware. By morning, the storm had abated, and of course, word is now revived, and everyone is, you because know, actually, thanks to Green's work, the engines get started again. Um, and it's not so much he's an engineer, it's, <coughs> it's how he's rotating people in and out and having everyone in motion. There is no panic on the monitor that day. And when you start to think about it, I don't know about anyone listening or in this room, there would have been widespread panic. And uh, uh, so, um, then, so he lays down on, you know, the morning, uh, the seventh was clear and beautiful, green, laid down for a much needed rest. However, when the ship passed Chincoteague Island, he was awakened by the most infernal noise I've ever heard in my life. Life. Green knew the ironclad was again in serious trouble, as he later wrote, we were just passing a shoal, and the sea suddenly became rough and right ahead. It came up with tremendous force through our anchor well and forced the air through our hawse pipe where the chain comes. And then the water would rush in a perfect stream clear to our berth deck over the wardroom table. The noise resembled the death groans of 20 men and was most dismal 
awful sound I ever heard. Now, these guys are exhausted, and once again, the ship is being uh, um, filled with water. The hawse pipe had not been plugged before leaving the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And so, um, actually, Green then goes forward and tries to stop the flow of water. We began to think that the monitor would never see daylight again. He had the engineers struggling to keep the boilers operating. The wheel ropes jumped off the steering wheel and the ship began to shear, stressing the tow line with the Seth low. The monitor began to face broadside. This is what he's writing his parents. Face broadside to the sea and rolled erratically. Somehow, he will later note that the Seth Lowe noted the distress of the monitor. And um, actually, the storm started to abate and they were able to get the tiller ropes back on and save the vessel. And you can imagine in a tow line in this heavy sea, and this was the tail end of the storm, as you all know what happens. Now, this was, uh, this was just the trip down, right? When they reached Cape Charles, he later commented, because when they reached Cape Charles, that this is five o'clock on the afternoon of March 8th, 1862, the battle is already happening. They are a day late and they all know it. A green seas was happening and he says you know i felt like i had lived 10 years just surviving down and i knew i had another 10 years to go and that is to fight what was happening off in hampton roads they had not seen the confederate ironclad as of yet however um as they entered hampton roads as green will pen another letter to his father our hearts were so full, and we vowed vengeance on the Merrimack. Think of the scene they're looking at. The, bur the burning, uh, uh, this is the engine room, which uh, you can see the Worthington pump down there. Uh, now, the engine room is not that big. I just want to let you know. Uh, this guy took uh, what is called poetic license. But nevertheless, Green is a line officer, and yet he had to take steps that helped organize the engineering department as they went south and to keep that little worthing and pump working. Um, now, this, of course, is his commander, John Worden. Um, and you can see Green in this case. Uh, let me figure out where he is right there. Okay, look at that dark look on his face. And remember what William Keeler said about him? He had eyes that could look through you. Now, this scene, there are several of these scenes, so we'll see Green looking in different ways, because so I think I use a couple more here. So, as he said, our hearts are very full because the Hampton Roads is lit up by the burning Congress, and this is an eerie scene. He goes with Worden uh, on board um, the Minnesota because when the monitor comes into Hampton Roads, it's ordered to go next to save the Minnesota. He over here, he's with Worden as Worden interfaces with Van Brunt. You know, he hears Worden says, you know, despite Van Brunt says, well, I don't know what you're going to do tomorrow, but if I... Uh, if that thing comes back, and I'll sink before surrender, you know, all this great rhetoric, and Worden merely says, I will protect you. Green is there, you know, in a, in a form that uh, gave strength. Many of the crew of the Minnesota will cheer as Green and Worden go back onto the monitor because they know tomorrow there's day work uh, will really... Um, arrived. As he wrote his mother, the night I arrived, I was on deck, witnessed the explosion of the burning Congress, a scene of the most terrible magnificence. 
She was wrapped in one sheet of flame when suddenly a volcano seemed to open instantaneously almost beneath our feet and a vast column of flame and fire shot forth until it seemed to pierce the skies. Wow, you know, they were about two miles from the wreck and yet embers would fall upon them. Now, I have to say that uh, Green's job was in the pilot house. Now, the pilot house had been arranged in part thanks to Green. Um, you know, it rotated on a spindle. It was in a little ring. And the big thing is, is you have a turret that turns on its own, and then you have a ship that moves on its own. So before they went into battle, they said, okay, this is how we're going to do it. We we're going to paint white marks below the turret because you can look right down into the berth deck from the turret, the grating. Okay. And, and we're going to put white marks. And so we're going to be able to look down. And when I'm told fire five points to starboard, think I know where I'm going. I'm going to be able to turn the turret and stop it and fire. Now they do have sight holes in the monitor side, believe it or not, but you can't see out of them, okay? So they don't work. So the only really way you can see out of the turret is going to be looking over the barrel of the 11-inch Dahlgren gun. Green realizes uh, that this is going to be a serious problem, but his communications with Worden in the pilot house is uh, through a speaking trumpet system. So what's going to happen is, now, as he's going to recall, Worden took his station in the pilot house, and by his side were Howard, the pilot, and Peter Williams, the quartermaster, who would steer the vessel throughout the engagement. My place was in the turret to work and fight the guns, and with me were Stoddard and Simmers and 16 brawny men eight to each gun, John Stocking, boatswain's mate, and John Lochran, um, seaman, were gun captains. Newton and his assistants were in the engine and fire rooms to manipulate the boilers and engines. Weber was in charge of the powder division. Remember, we got a very small turret space for our weapons, and so they have to keep it supplies. Now, uh, remember I told you that uh, we got this turning turret, ships going this way. We have these side holes. We can look over the barrel of the gun. Well, this immediately has a problem. Once you fire those 11 inch Dahlgren guns, what happens? Black powder residue goes everywhere. So they, they really, and they don't know where the ship is heading because this battle is fought in concentric circles. So Greenwood uh, write his father, my only view of the world outside of the tower was over the muzzles of the guns, which cleared the ports only by a few inches. When the guns were run in, the portholes were covered by heavy iron pendulums. They actually did not use them, uh, but uh, um, pierced by small holes to allow iron rammer and sponge handles to protrude. Uh, to, and he goes on to explain how he had to work the pendulums. They stop using them because they can't use them. And he talks about the white marks. In other words, he will have to say, I continually ask, well, how does the Merrimack bear? The captain would reply. Now, I have to tell you, not only do we have the problem of not seeing the white marks, not being able to really see outside the turret, but also the speaking system doesn't work. So you have to have a series of runners going back and forth across. Um, so Green would ask one of the runners, like Daniel Toffee, how does the Merrimack bear? And he'd finally get an answer from Worden, on the starboard beam or on the port quarter, as the case may be. Then the difficulty for me was to determine the direction of the starboard beam or port quarter or any other bearing 
It finally resulted that when the gun was ready to fire, the turret would be started in a revolving journey in search of the target, and when found, was taken and fired on the fly because the turret could not be stopped. So you got to figure Green is actually, re I mean, he's reinventing what to do. And Green is the guy that recognizes, oh my gosh, you know, the, the bearings of the guns. Here's another view. Um, this is my favorite view of Green. Uh, there he is. And he looks stern, doesn't he? Uh, and he has to be, because when in the turret, he has this major problem of trying to figure out how to fire. Because the issue is, the level of the guns is at the same level as the pilot house and the um, smokestacks, right? And they they have been removed, but firing over them would cause debris and other things to fall into the blowers and the smokestacks, or you could blow the top of the pilot house out. It's called monitor roulette, uh, but in essence, a green realize that no, we do not have a 360 range. We have about 140 and then another 140. So this is a problem that green, you know, despite of all of Erickson's mechanical genius, you know, I like to say Erickson was not a sailor. He invents a ship that most sailors would say was not a seaworthy ve vessel. Well, anyway, what's going to happen is, is that uh, Green uh, um, will, you know, one at one moment, the Virginia tries to ram uh, the monitor and Green um, will actually, um, you know, fire almost simultaneously both guns. You couldn't fire them both at the same time, but almost simultaneously does. John Taylor Wood's gonna say, um, an, um, all the crew of the after guns were knocked over by the concussion of the shot hitting the side of the Virginia. Green knew his shots had hit home. Had the guns been loaded with 30 pounds of powder, which the charge subsequently used with similar guns, it probably would have been this shot that had penetrated her armor, but the charge being limited, it meant the shot rebounded without doing any more damage than possibly than to start one of the beams of the engines backing. Now, uh, so the battle now is reached near its conclusion. There've been four hours of fighting. Uh, everyone in the turrets been begrimmed with uh, powder. Uh, Green actually during the battle went out on the turret's deck when the ship was having its ammunition reloaded. And, you know, it, they could see that the turret had not been really damaged. Uh, Green, um, however, uh, will all of a sudden receive a urgent message because the monitor tries to ram the Virginia, it misses, and as a result of that, a shot hits, uh, whoopsie, um, the shot hits, and the pilot house, wounding Worden, and so Peter Williams pulls the ship off to shoal, Green knows something is wrong, William Keeler goes up and says, you know, Worden has been wounded, Green then uh, leaves command of the turret to Alvin Steimers. He'll go down, he'll see Green. I mean, see Worden. He says, he's a ghastly sight. And Green, um, Samuel Howard, uh, William Durst, and uh, will help Worden out of the pilot house into his cabin. Now, Green is now in command. And he looks at Worden and says, what do you want me to do? And Worden says, look, you know, I'm dying, I'm blinded, I'm wounded. Um, I, I leave it to do to do what's best, but save the Minnesota. So Green takes command of the ship um, and just think going into that pilot house, 
pilot house is made out of iron logs. So the top part of those iron logs are what? Blown off. So you have a stream of cold air coming in. And so Green brings his ship back into action. But this takes a half hour. And during that time, the tide is going out and the Virginia decides to go back into the Elizabeth River and fight another day. Um, when Green realized uh, the battle was over, he anchors next to the Minnesota. Uh, and uh, uh, he later would write that he thought the Merrimack was in a sinking condition and, and, uh, um, and it had not Worden been wounded, he would have followed up. But his orders were very straightforward is that he had to protect the Minnesota. And with the pilot house so seriously damaged, he does exactly that. In fact, he will write, we have definite orders to act on the defense and protect the Minnesota. Therefore, after the Merrimack retreated, we went to the Minnesota and remained by her side until she was afloat. General Wool and Secretary Fox, that's Assistant Secretary Gustavus Vasa Fox, um, uh, both complimented me very highly for acting, as I did and said it was the strict military plan to follow. This is the reason we did not sink the Merrimack, and everyone says we exa acted exactly right. Now, I have to tell you, uh, actually, Fox uh, will go on board the on, on the monitor and he looks at Green. Well, gentlemen, you look as though you just went through one of the greatest naval conflicts on record. No, sir, said Green. We haven't done much fighting, merely drilling the men at the guns a little. Green's boldness was all part of all that nervous energy that had been exploding up within them. Well, Green is going to be commander of the Monitor uh, for merely um, 32 hours. Um, and they think he is too young uh, to really take the responsibilities of command of this vessel. And so eventually they'll order William Jeffers to take command. Uh, Green never really mentions much about Jeffers. Other people on the ship do. He was terrible. In fact, he really does not talk about any of his senior officers other than Robert, uh, excuse me, John Lomar Worden and John Pine Bankhead. Now, he is there, uh, although he calls like Jeffers a talented, desirable, educated, energetic, experienced, and battled man. But later he will say he cares too much for discipline. Now, Green will be there during the Battle of Drury's Bluff. He actually goes on the monitor, as you can see here, is right there. It actually will move up to here during the battle, uh, but it can't elevate its guns. Green will say, this is futile, we can't fire. And so they fall back to the position where they are. Actually, Green and Keeler go up on top of the turret to try and observe what's happening. Because the Galena is taking, and that's the Galena uh, right here. The Galena is taking a pounding. And so while they're up there in just moments, Confederate sharpshooters will fire at them. Keeler says his coat is pierced by three bullets. Green has one shot go through his hat. They go below. So Green stays with the vessel, I have to say. Um, and uh, he will actually be on the vessel when it gets its orders to go south on Christmas Day, 1862, um, and, or not April, December 25th, 1862. And uh, he will merely say, this is his new commander, John Pine Bankhead, who actually Green thought very highly of. Um, of course, uh, the monitor, which when they get orders to go south, Green merely says, this is not an ocean-going vessel, right? 
and he meant it. He knew the ship was merely a harbor defense. Nevertheless, uh, Green will survive the sinking. He actually jumps into, tries to jump into the lifeboat. He misses and gets pulled into the um, uh, lifeboat, or not, it's not really a lifeboat, it's a cutter, uh, by uh, Grenville Weeks. In turn, William Keeler will make a jump and miss and actually, and, and Green will throw on the line, then pull him into the... So you got to realize how harrowing it was to try and survive. Well, Green does so and will continue in the Navy. Um, his next assignment after the Monitor will be Executive Officer of the USS Florida, uh, which is commanded by... John Pine Bankhead. You know, Green is an extremely loyal officer. Um, he will uh, um, continue to serve under uh, Bankhead and actually takes over as commander of the Florida when Bankhead falls seriously ill. Um, he does get married during the war on 9 October 1863. And he then gets assigned to the Brooklyn Navy Yard as a special assistant um, for an inspector for ironclads. Guess who he's working with? John Worden. Now, after the war, he will become a professor at United States Naval Academy. Uh, he then takes uh, as executive officer of the USS Marblehead. He then uh, will actually become uh, eventually commander of the um, uh, Iroquois, he actually goes um, as commander of the several ships in this period between 1868 and 60 and 71. Uh, he then, uh, in 73, will be named Superintendent of Grounds, United States Naval Academy. That's where he is going to be with Worden. They get sued over this property I mentioned before the uh, talk. And uh, basically, um, he will uh, then, then, then take command of the dispatch. He becomes executive officer of the Portsmouth Navy Yard. Um, and uh, um, in um, 1884. Now, while there, he publishes an article in Century Magazine, later becomes part of Battles and Leaders. Uh, where it says inside the turret. And he writes certain things that others disagree with. In fact, many people are, ven are vengeful about what Green says his role in the battle was. And as a result of that, now when we think about Green, we look at those dark eyes. You know, he is 5'11, black hair, hazel eyes, dark complexion. You know, uh, and remember what Keeler said? He had eyes that could look through you. Well, nevertheless, uh, we believe um, that uh, due to the death of his wife and also, and child, also the impending um, comments about his article, he will commit suicide um, and... Uh, uh, his death was on um, 12, uh, 11th of December, 1884, with a pistol shot to the head. Thus ended the career of an outstanding officer, uh, Nathan, uh, excuse me, <laughs> it's easy to, you know, there are all these great greens, you know. He is a relative of Nathaniel Green, of, you know, the great Quaker from Rhode Island. Uh, his family is from Rhode Island. Uh, Nathaniel Green, great hero of the Revolutionary War. His father's a great hero of the Civil War. He himself was a great hero. Although a junior officer, it is his actions in the turret that helped the Monitor actually return fire. Even though it's not as effective as it should have been, Green keeps the ship in action and does exactly what he was supposed to do 
after uh, Worden's wounding. And that's one of the things he was highly criticized for. Nevertheless, Samuel Dana Green goes down in history as the man that was in the turret during the great battle between ironclad ships. Thank you.